Abaddon is very well positioned in the avionics market today. 2020 is the year where we're going to take some of the business aviation progress we made in 2019 and really turn it into a central focus. General Aviation has been the cornerstone of our business at Avanon for over 25 years. We've taken what we've learned there and applied it to other market segments, helicopters and business aviation. Even with our growth up market, we continue to develop innovative products that benefit all of our pilots. Our pro pilots were telling us, I wish I had the function of our IFD in the FMS that I fly every day. So we listened, and in the fall of 2019, we launched Atlas. One of the real values of Atlas is that it gives new life to legacy aircraft that don't need a million dollar avionics upgrade, but would like to have LPV, be able to run their TCAS, be able to consolidate their controls in an easy to use, understandable format. So the Avidine approach is to develop a partnership with our dealers, not tell them what to do, but provide them with the tools that they need to be successful. In 2020, Avidine will be launching our new dealer portal, as well as our training app, which will give our dealers access to installation documents and training videos from their mobile device while in the aircraft. Avidine has made, in the last uh, year or so, significant investments in a number of areas. We've replaced our screen printers, our pick-and-place equipment, our selective soldering systems, and what this allows us to do is build a lot more cards for the expected volume we're going to have in the future. We build very high-quality cards with these systems, and we'll be doing so for a long time. In addition, we have a project going on at the Orlando Melbourne Airport where we're building our own hangar, which will allow us to improve our certification test flight activities along with better accommodating customers who fly in to visit us. Going forward, the future is bright for Avidine. We've announced some new products and we're going into new markets this year. Our team is growing, we need to expand our facilities, and we have a number of exciting new announcements that'll be happening later in the year. There's never been a better time to grow your business with Avidon. Hey everyone, I just want to start off by thanking everybody for showing up for this uh, webinar training. Uh, it's uh, another one in a, a long series that we're going to be doing here at Avidine. So um, thank you guys for showing up today. What we're going to be talking about is EFIS interfaces. IFD is interfaced with EFIS systems. Um, training session is going to be recorded, and we're going to make this available as webinar on demand after the fact. So uh, for any of you guys that may have some folks in your shop that couldn't make it to this training event or um, you know, may benefit from some of this information in the future. Keep that in mind. So first and foremost, the IFD has two distinctly different sets of Airing 429 connections that we're going to use with most EFIS systems. <clears throat> there's a GPS interface and then there's a VOR ILS interface. And it's important to understand the difference between those two, uh, especially when we get into doing some of the troubleshooting. So we'll, we'll get a little bit deeper into some of this stuff. The GPS 429 connections are located on the P1001 P connector. Um, we've got GPS airing 429 in and out. Those are gonna get configured on your main airing 429 config page. So that main airing 429 config page is for your GPS data it's your gps in and out um, the inside coming from the EFIS system is usually going to be you know your air data your um you know selected course all of that kind of good stuff each port gets configured for speed you got low speed which is uh 12.5 kilobits per second and high is 100 And then you've got a data configuration. That data configuration is going to determine the specific protocol that we're going to use, which is going to differ from one EFIS to another. So 
uh, kind of keep that in mind. These configuration settings, one of the things about Airing 429 that makes it super useful is there are configuration settings that are, are uh, compatible, but there are multiple variations of that configuration setting that all may be compatible. So <clears throat> typically with an Airing 429 system, um, the Airing 429 uh, data buses, if you've got a receiver, <clears throat> you'll have Airing 429 labels coming through to the receiver. The receiver will take the Airing 429 labels that it needs and discard the rest. Um, so whenever we're, we're trying to uh, put these things together, we kind of want to keep that in mind. There are specific configuration settings that are going to give us the most bang for our buck as far as receiving the most labels or transmitting the most Airing 429 labels uh, to get the most use out of the system. And we'll we'll go into some of those. And then there's the output side from the IFD, and that's going to typically send out your lat long, ground speed, track info, waypoint, etc. Uh, out to the EFIS system. I'm sure you guys have noticed there's, there are additional settings on this page, uh, the first of which is the SDI. So if you guys are familiar with, with how the system kind of works, Okay, so, sounds like we've got a couple of folks out here having connection issues, so bear with us for just a second. Um, we're going to have them try to reconnect. And, and for those of you guys that can hear me, there's a spot where you can actually reconnect to the webinar um, up toward the top right-hand side of your screen. So if you guys are having a hard time, uh, by all means, do that. All right. Um, so the SDI setting is, is what we're talking about here. So for those of you guys that are familiar with these systems um, in the aircraft, what you wind up with is um, a, a scenario where on the EFA system, you're going to go in and select, you know, GPS one or GPS two. This is how the system knows which one you know, you're talking to or which one you're listening to. This is where you would go in and you would set the IFD up to tell it, Hey, I'm GPS one or I'm GPS two. And those settings equate to LNAV one or LNAV two on your SDI setting. And then there's the VNAV setting. So what this is, is this is the vertical guidance, airing 429 labels um, when we're talking about doing GPS approaches. So <clears throat> we get phone calls quite often from folks who will do a uh, you know WAS upgrade on the aircraft throw the IFD in there and they say everything works great except I'm not getting any vertical guidance on GPS approach um, check this first because there's a really really good chance that the labels are disabled and if those are disabled then that's exactly what it's going to do it's going to not send air rank 429 at least for the vertical guidance piece And then we've got our NAV or VLOC connections. <clears throat> Those are located on the P1006 connector. And they get configured on this VOR localizer glide slope config page um, for airing 429. The NAV or VLOC connections get configured for speed and format, just like um, just like on the GPS side of things. Now, <clears throat> something to keep in mind, if you guys see this photo here that we've got highlighted, um, our transmit data output right now in this photo is set for VHF GPS 429. We've had a rash of these lately um, where some folks have installed these with a typical EFA system and they're setting this up for VHF GPS 429. And that's not a correct setting unless you are installing this in a ProLine 21 setup and you have glass enabled, okay? Um, that's gonna be the key there is, is if it's glass enabled, 
that's part of what the glass system does. And maybe we'll do a separate training on glass just to, to get all the way to the bottom of it. But for your, your standard EFIS interface, you're going to want this to be just VHF 429, okay? All right, um, and if you notice here on the <clears throat> VOR localizer glide slope bearing 429 config page, we also have an SDI setting here. So with these SDI settings, if you go to your EFIS system, your PFD or what have you, um, you know, you go to select GPS1, GPS2, we saw where those SDI settings were. Um, then this is for the nav side. So if you go select VLOP1, VLOP2, um, this is how it determines which unit it's talking to and which unit's driving. So the first interface we want to talk about um, is the Avidyne Integra interface. It's pretty straightforward. Um, for IFD 1 or 2 GPS out, we're going to configure that guy for low speed, gamma 429, graphics with intersections. It's going to give us the most data on that airing 429, so the highest number of labels that we can um, spit out to that guy. SDI settings uh, for IFD1, we're going to set that for LNAV1. For IFD2, we're going to set it for LNAV2. VNAV enable labels. Um, the Integra PFDs require release 7 or later for WAS. So that enable labels setting is only going to be good if your PFD is WAS enabled. Um, if you guys have any question on that, by all means, get a hold of us in tech support, um, and we can help you get to the bottom of whether or not your PFD is even capable of doing WASP stuff yet. Okay. We're going to configure IFD 1 and 2 GPS input for low speed and Honeywell EFIS. Now, I know that there are a lot of these systems out there that you know, came from the factory with GNS units, and those GNS units were configured for Sandell EHSI. That setting works, um, and a lot of people that have done these as, you know, sliding replacements for the GNS system, they've just carried that setting over, and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. That absolutely works, um, but like I had mentioned before, there are some settings that, that better optimize the interface um, to make use of more labels. And essentially what that amounts to is the input coming into the IFD. The IFD can actually take in more information than the old GNS systems could. So there is a better setting there. Uh, Honeywell EFIS is a better setting as far as the IFD is concerned because that's the setting that allows us to make the most out of all the airing 429 labels coming in from the PFD. Um, on the VOR localizer glide slope 429 output, we're going to set that guy up for low speed. It's going to be VHF 429, and we're going to set our SDI for VOR ILS 1 or VOR ILS 2, depending on which IFD it is. Next, we're going to talk about the IFD interface with G500, G600 interfaces um, to the, the Garmin GEUs. Now, we do not have the TXI systems currently in our installation manual, but um, all of the information that I have tells me that the interface is the same, and I do believe that the TXIs are coming for our installation manual. We just haven't gotten around to getting those added yet. So let's go through this. Um, First off, our GPS 429 output, it's going to be low speed, gamma 429. Our SDI, we're going to set IFD1 up for LNAV1, IFD2 for LNAV2, and VNAV to enable labels. It's going to give us our vertical guidance. For our GPS input, we're going to do um, low speed, Garmin GDU is going to be the setting for the data side. Uh, 
And then for the IFD VOR localizer glide slope output, it's also going to be low speed VHF 429. Uh, here we're going to set up our SDIs for VOR ILS 1 on IFD 1, VOR ILS 2 on IFD 2. Now, if you notice on the G500, G600 interfaces, they asked for an RS-232 uh, as well. That RS-232 output is going to be configured for MAP-MX. Um, the GDU or the G500, G600 system basically uses this GPS information as a comparison um, for the AHARS data to make sure that what the GPS is seeing matches up with what the AHARS is seeing. So um, if you wind up you know, with some, some AHARS reporting no GPS type thing, go to check this setting because there's a good chance maybe that got missed. Okay. For time mark out, the IFDs don't have a specific configuration setting for that. Um, if it's wired, it's there. If it's not wired, obviously it's not. Um, the IFD does provide time mark out plus, but not the minus. We do not provide the negative side of this. Um, so the negative or 1B line should be just left disconnected. And next we've got our Aspen interfaces. Um, there's a lot of different variations here, <laughs> as I'm sure a lot of you guys know. So by all means, um, stick with me here. We're going to start off talking about just dual IFDs interface directly to an Aspen EFD 1000 um, without an ACU in the mix. We'll get into the ACUs uh, here in, in a little bit, a little further down the road. Um, but let's let's start off here and we'll keep it simple and we'll get a little bit deeper as we go. So um, for the IFD GPS output, we're going to set those guys up for Gamma 429 graphics with intersections. Um, SDIs are going to be IFD1 is going to be LNAV1, IFD2 is LNAV2. VNAV we're going to set for enable labels. That should give us our vertical guidance on GPS approaches. From the EFD1000, we're going to set up our GPS input to low speed, and we're going to use that Honeywell EFIS setting. Um, Again, that's the best setting that's going to make the best use of the information that's on those 429 lines. For the IFD VOR uh, localizer glide slope output, we're going to set those guys up for low speed. Data is going to be set for VHF 429. And we'll set the SDIs for VOR ILS 1 on IFD 1, VOR ILS 2 on IFD number 2. Now, here's where things get a little bit stickier. Um, <clears throat> there has to be the configurations that take place on the Aspen side of things as well. And uh, for those of you guys that are well familiar with the Aspen systems, you know that, that there's a lot of different options for how this thing can be installed and interfaced. Um, combine that with the IFD, where there are a lot of options for how the IFD can be installed and interfaced, this can become a pretty convoluted installation pretty quick. So um, let's go in and take a look at some of the, the setups on the Aspen side of things. Uh, first one we're going to talk about is NAV setup A. So, again, we're assuming that uh, GPS NAV1 and GPS NAV2 are both IFDs, okay? Um, for NAV setup A, we're going to set up GPS NAV1 for config A, GPS NAV2 for config A. Now, there are a lot of different variations here. Um, if that number two GPS NAV is something else, if you've got a KX155 and a KLN90, or what have you. There's a lot of different options here. We're going to get a little bit deeper on that uh, here in a few, and I'm going to give you guys a really, really good cheat sheet that you can take a screenshot of and sock away somewhere. Uh, but for right now, we're talking strictly dual IFDs uh, wired directly to an Aspen EFD 1000. All right. Next, we're going to take a look at NAV setup B. Now, NAV setup B is our 429 settings. 
And if you notice, there's a lot of different options in that column up uh, in the middle of the screen there as well. But it's pretty straightforward if we're just doing dual IFDs and it's wired direct. Um, so port one is going to be GPS one. That's going to be the port that's receiving the gamma 429 graphics with intersections from IFD number one. We're going to set port two for VLOC one. That's going to be the input that's receiving the 429 VOR ILS stuff from IFD number one. Um, in port number three, GPS two, that's going to be your gamma 429 graphics with intersections from IFD number two. VLOC two, same thing, VOR ILS info from IFD number two. Nav setup C is where we're going to go to set up our port speeds. Um, for the most part, we recommend setting it all to low. If you want to set everything for high speed, you can. Um, there's not any real advantage to it. So we just recommend set everything to low speed. It makes it a lot easier when you guys call in or, uh, you know, another shop calls in down the road and says, hey, you know, um, I'm having a problem with X, Y, or Z. If we, if we can safely assume it's all set up to low speed, then you're good to go. There are a couple of scenarios where you might want to set it to high speed um, with an ACU2, and we'll get into that in a few minutes. But uh, for the most part, just use low speed if you can. And uh, miscellaneous config C, we want to take a look at a couple of settings here. Uh, but the big one is that course SDI. So not only do we have to set the SDI on the IFDs, uh, both on the GPS and on the VOR ILS side of things, but we also have to go in here and set up our course SDI setting on the Aspen side of things as well. Um, and what this does is this basically lets the Aspen know which selected course information to listen to um, based off of the IFDs. So, as you can see, if the IFDs are not configured correctly on the SDI settings or if they're just set to common, and then if we go in here on the Aspen side and set this for NAV1, NAV2, it's going to confuse things. If we go in on the Aspen and set this for common, but we have number one and number two set up on the IFDs, it's going to confuse things. In all honesty, if you go in there and set all of this to common on both the Aspen and the IFD side, um, it still can confuse some things because everything's listening to everything at that point. So um, it makes the installation go much, much smoother if we go ahead and set those SDIs and kind of understand what that's doing. It's actually designating that unit, um, you know, for NAV1, NAV2, GPS1, GPS2. And the other thing we're going to do is we're going to set our OBS display to enabled. So over on the left-hand side here, you're going to see a, a whole list of Airing 429 labels. So these are the Airing 429 labels that the EFD-1000 is spitting out. And that line is going to get paralleled and go out to both IFDs. Um, this is your Honeywell EFIS input on the IFD, if you will. So... I want you guys to kind of just at least make a note of how long that list is and what information is is there, okay? You can see we've got selected course, we've got heading datum, we've got lateral deviation, vertical deviation, pressure altitude, pressure altitude barrel corrected, true airspeed, the barrel correction itself in inches of mercury, um, ILS energized, GPS nav select, back course, altitude engaged, those four are pretty much for ACUs. Um, but then we've also got course data and we've got mag heading okay so there's a lot of information coming across those those 429 lines um and that's going to be important to kind of make a note of because as we talk about adding an acu into the mix that starts to change some of the equations and i'll show you guys how this kind of works so the way that our installation manual and the aspen installation manual show this interface is that same airing 429 out of the EFD 1000 rather than running out to the inputs of the IFDs it's going to the ACU and then the ACU is spitting out an airing 429 data stream that gets paralleled into the IFDs 
There's an issue with that, though. The ACUs will actually strip out a bunch of those Airing 429 labels that the IFD could be using. So let's have a look at this. Um, if you wire it the way the book says, you're going to have uh, ACU Airing 429 output. So if it's just a straight ACU over on the left-hand side there, you'll get selected course and you'll get magnetic heading. That's it. That thing's not spitting out altitude. It's not spitting out barrel corrected altitude. It's not spitting out any of that stuff. Okay. You'll get selected course. You'll get mag heading. That's all. Over on the right-hand side, if you've got an ACU2, it spits out a little bit more information. You'll get selected course, mag heading, pressure altitude, barrel corrected altitude, and true airspeed. Um, but as you can see, that's still not nearly as much information as we're getting out of the EFD-1000 itself uh, if we're wired direct. So what do we do about it? Now, here's kind of what we recommend. There is a way to go about this where you can bypass the ACU altogether. And I need to be careful how I word that, I suppose, because we're not actually bypassing the ACU. The ACU is still included in the system. We're just bypassing the ACU for this airing 429 data stream. So rather than paralleling to both IFDs off of the output side of the ACU, we're going to parallel off of the input side of the ACU or the output side of the EFD-1000 itself and just feed that directly over to the IFDs. There is absolutely no problem with doing it this way. Okay. And if we do that, now we get this full data set. All of these airing 429 labels are now going to the IFD uh, just like it would be if we were wired direct without an ACU in the equation. Um, but the ACU still needs those airing 429s as well. We can't just, just ignore that part. So that airing 429 has to be paralleled off of the input side of the ACU, but the ACU still needs to get that information from the EFD-1000. Um, I hope that makes sense. If you guys have questions over this, uh, by all means, feel free to shoot me an email, uh, shoot an email over tech support, and I'll do my best to, to kind of explain that through a little bit further, okay? <clears throat> um, I just wanted to show this drawing to kind of give you guys an idea of where this thing goes and and what starts to happen if we're using an rs-232 or an analog gps number two um, an analog vlog number two analog autopilot um, all of those pieces are going to interface with the acu itself okay and if you look at the top of the acu there that airing 429 transmit out that actually is the line that we're talking about moving um, over to the EFD-1000 itself, tapping in um, there at the bottom, the PFD-429 transmit 1A and 1B. So all of that being said, all of those configuration settings that we talked about a few minutes ago um, get a little bit more complicated when we start adding an ACU into the mix. And those configuration settings are going to change based off of what exactly that number two combination is, because we could have an analog GPS number two and no nav two. We could have an analog nav two and no GPS two. We could have analog both GPS two and nav two. So <clears throat> um, basically what I've done here, and you guys might want to screenshot this, um, this should be fairly valuable uh, for any of you guys that do a lot of IFDs to Aspen uh, installations here. So the left-hand column, this is what it's going to be if it's dual IFDs with an ACU. This is what all those config settings are going to be on the Aspen side of things. Um, the center is if we've got a number one IFD an analog NAV2, I just put KX155 in there as a as an example, could be a 165, could be any number of things for a NAV2, um, with no GPS number two, so this is NAV2 only, analog NAV2 only, 
this is what all the Aspen setups are going to be. And then on the far right, we've got uh, a number one IFD with an analog nav two and an analog or RS-232 GPS number two um, with an ACU. So uh, again, screenshot this, or if you guys want me to send you a, a copy of this that um, you can go in and, and use and take a look at, by all means, you know, hit me up, let me know, and, and we'll, uh, we'll get you that information. But it, it's a fairly nice little cheat sheet that I've used multiple, multiple times. Um, probably with some of you guys when you guys call me on the phone and then I say what all else is in the aircraft <laughs> this is the little cheat sheet that I pull up and and walk through on those config settings all right um, that's pretty much it for Aspen so let's jump in on the Garmin G5 a lot of you guys have called me about this interface as well so let's get into it first and foremost the IFD is gonna have an RS-232 output and that's going to be map MX that we're spitting out. If it's a dual G5 installation, that's going to get paralleled out to both G5s. Our GPS 429 output is going to be low speed, gamma 429. Our GPS 429 input, we're going to set up for low speed GAD 42. Now, I want everybody to kind of pay close attention here because that GAD 42 setting will include, it will allow the IFD to accept all of the airing 429 labels that would typically be reserved for air data EFIS, as well as the GAD 42 setting itself. So you don't need to run multiple 429s to the IFD. A single pair of 429s will give the IFD all of the information from the GAD29 that you need. Okay. SDI, obviously, again, if it's IFD number one, set it for one. If it's IFD number two, set it for two. It's a little less important here um, because if you've got dual navs set up in this way um, where they're independent, um, I don't believe that there's a way to select. Well, there might be with the new software. There, there might, they may have added the ability to select nav one, nav two on a single G5 setup like this. But um, for most of them that I've run into or encountered, um, they're they're not. They're one nav per you know pair of G5s. Um, and then we've got our VOR localized glide slope 429 output. Um, we're going to set this guy up for low speed, VHF 429, and again, our SDI settings, uh, VLOC 1, VLOC 2. So, um, that's pretty much it for those interfaces. Um, again, if you guys have any questions over any of that stuff, um, we're going to have a little question and answer period uh, coming up here at the end of this thing. Um, feel free to ask it there. Or if you want, you can always shoot an email over at tech support at avidine.com um, or email me directly or shoot an email over to training at avidine.com. Uh, there's a lot of resources out there. <clears throat> so let's jump into troubleshooting this. So, so let's say we've done an installation and um, we've done IFDs to an EFIS interface. And I want to be able to go in here and, and check this thing out. Um, let's say I'm not real sure whether it's working correctly or not. So I'm going to give you guys some troubleshooting tools uh, that you can use here. So first and foremost, if you go to the AUX page group, the utilities tab, and click on calculators, the very first calculator that you'll see in the top box up there is an air data calculator. So an air data calculator comes in really, really handy for us in troubleshooting these systems because this is all of the information that we're typically going to be receiving from an EFIS system. So we can go in here and make sure that we're receiving altitude, um, that we're receiving outside air temperature, heading, all of that good stuff. So if you look in this, in this box here, this air data calculator box, the information that's populated in green is information that is being received from an external source. 
So what that means to me is if I've got this IFD and it's connected to, let's say, an Aspen or an Integra PFD, this is a really quick and easy way for me to go check that 429 line from the PFD to the IFD to make sure that we're getting that data across. Um, now, bear in mind, if we're talking about an Aspen and we've got an ACU included, those airing 429 labels are very, very different depending on how I decided to wire it. So, you know, keep that in mind. If it seems like you're seeing part of the data but not all of it, um, you know, it, it may be worth going and taking a look at how you've wired things and how things are put together and, and what airing 429 labels are actually being spit out. Um, so that's tool number one. Uh, another place we can go for troubleshooting an EFIS interface is right here in maintenance mode. There's a configuration page in here for main inputs. On those, this main inputs page, <clears throat> it's going to show us all of the information that's being received from an EFIS system, um, if it's being received anyway. So you can see here, we've got outside air temperature, we've got heading, we've got barrel altitude, we've got pressure altitude, um, indicated airspeed, true airspeed, CDI selection, lots of good stuff here, okay? Um, again, this is where knowing what your 429 labels are um, and how that's gonna work is gonna be important. And here's another little tool. Uh, if we go into maintenance mode, we can go to the aux page group in maintenance mode. We're going to go to the status tab, and we're going to cycle the info button down there on the left-hand side. We're just going to cycle through that guy until it says info A429. And what this does is this takes us to our airing 429 input data monitor, where it actually tells us words and errors coming across. Now, one thing that is is worth considering here is that the way that an airing 429 differential data bus works this page is not going to show us a problem if you have your 429 a and b lines twisted so let me say that again <clears throat> if you have your airing 429 a and b lines crossed up coming into the ifd this page is not going to be very useful for you. It's going to show you that there's a lot of data coming in and it's going to look like everything's working okay. However, it's not. It's going to be reverse logic information um, and the IFD doesn't know how to read it in reverse logic, but it's not going to report it as an error uh, because it sees the data there. Okay, so something to think about. And lastly, I want to talk about demo mode. Um, for those of you guys that are familiar with demo mode, that's great. For those of you guys that are not, I want you to get familiar with demo mode. This can save you a lot of headaches in the future. If you're going to, to check, do a functional checkout on an EFIS interface system that is, you know, a fresh install, or even somebody comes in and says, hey, you know, I, I think, you know, something's configured wrong or something's not working correctly between my IFD and my Aspen or whatever. Um, for all of those little squawks and all of those problems that are really, really hard to troubleshoot on the ground sitting in your hangar, demo mode can save the day, guys. I can't stress it enough. The way that the demo mode in the IFD works is the outputs will actually go active. So if I pull the airplane into my hangar and I put the IFD in a demo mode, I can put in an origin, I can put in a flight plan, and that IFD is going to go fly the flight plan. And my Aspen PFD is going to show me magenta lines, deviation data, distance to waypoint info, all of that. Like I'm actually flying the thing. Okay. Now, you might get some heading red X type stuff. You may get some AHARS miscompare type stuff because the airplane doesn't know it's flying other than the GPS info that's coming in. But it really, really can come in handy. I mean, it'll even drive the autopilot in demo mode. Okay, so 
Um, this is a huge, huge thing to help troubleshoot those problems that you can really only see in the air or that are very hard to duplicate on the ground. Um, all of those outputs, by the way, are in, in demo mode are GPS related. So it, it won't fake uh, an ILS approach in demo mode, for instance, but all you guys have NAP testers, so you can test out an ILS without ever doing anything out of the ordinary. Um, so demo mode, something that, that we get a lot of questions about uh, once people figure out how useful this demo thing is, is how do I create a demo file? How do I put this thing in, in the demo mode? So here's how you're going to do it. Go to your computer, throw a thumb drive in there, wipe it clean um, so it needs to have nothing else on it. Go ahead and reformat it, FAT32. Open Notepad. And once you open Notepad, just go in and type the word demo on the top line. And you're going to go in there and select Save As. Uh, if you just hit the file, it'll give you the little drop down windows where you can save as. And then you're going to go find your thumb drive. In my case, it's the Transcend E drive. Yours is probably going to be labeled something different. Don't sweat it. Go find your thumb drive. And you'll see how the file name there automatically defaults to demo.txt. Go ahead and save it. And once it's saved, you're going to go back into your thumb drive and you're going to go look at that thing and you're going to right click on it and you're going to select rename. When you rename it, you're going to go in and delete just the .txt, just the file extension piece to this. So you're renaming the file to just demo, not demo.txt, just demo. And then it's going to give you a little warning. It says if you change the file name extension, the file might become unusable. Are you sure you want to change it? Go ahead and tell it yes. And as soon as you tell it yes, it, it will save that as just a, a straight demo file. Now, what you don't want to do is try to open that file now with your computer to see what's on it. It won't open. Your Windows machine doesn't know how to open a file that doesn't have a file extension, but the IFD does. Okay. So when you're all done, it should show you a file on your thumb drive, just labeled as demo with no file extension whatsoever. Once you see that, you're good to go. Now take that thumb drive, stick it in the IFD, power the IFD on. It should take you straight into demo mode. You'll get a little warning message at the beginning saying not to be used in flight. And off you go. Um, something I would be remiss not to talk about, though, is when we go to put these things in demo mode, we want to make absolutely certain that we pull the breakers for our transponders and for our onboard radar. <clears throat> um, onboard radar, in a few instances anyway, the air to ground uh, switching on that guy is tied into the pseudo weight on wheels out of the IFD. In most transponder interfaces with the IFD, it's using pseudo weight on wheels out of the IFD. So what will happen is as soon as you put the IFD in a demo mode, like I said, those outputs go active. So it's going to start acting like it's in the air. So it's going to start giving your uh, transponder GPS info, just like you're out there flying around. Um, and if you're close enough to a tower, they are going to, to see what you're squawking <laughs> and they're not going to be very happy with you. So, uh, keep it, keep that in mind. We definitely want to make sure that we pull the breakers for our transponders, um, and any radar system that may be tied into, um, that pseudo weight on wheels output. Um, and I think we're about ready to open it up for questions, but before we open it up for you guys' questions, I want you guys to go answer one question of mine. Um, if you guys scroll down to the polls section, if you haven't already, <clears throat> um, go ahead and let us know what, you know, for, for this these webinar series uh, that we're working on, let us know what specific uh, interfaces or what specific, you know, um, topics of training would be most useful for you guys in your shops. So uh, we're going to use this feedback to determine what we're going to build the next training event around. So 
please let us know. And aside from that, I think we're ready to open it up for questions. So I've got George here with me, and he's gonna gonna go ahead and read these off. So if you guys have any questions, go ahead and, and go to the questions section um, down below there, and and go ahead and ask it in there. And George will ask the question out loud, and we'll we'll see if we can't get an answer for you. Okay. All right, TJ. Thanks. So Michael Hodby. He asks, I've just installed an IFD 440 with dual G5s. Everything works perfectly, but then I had a constant message on the IFD aux page stating GAD 42 requires service. The GAD 29B was swapped with another unit, still no change. The G5 config page showing CANT network all working along with Aaron 429, GAD, and 232 from the IFD. Also, the IFD was showing Eric 429 in with no errors. Any ideas about this GAD42 requires service message? Yes. Um, the only scenario that I've seen the GAD42 requires service message popping up is if it's interfaced with a Garmin GFC autopilot. Um, and that is something that our engineering folks are digging into and figuring out what is causing uh, that message to pop up. However, it does not seem to have any kind of effect or impact on the flyability of the airplane. It's kind of a nuisance message. Um, so it, it's something that we're working on. We're well aware of it. It is a nuisance message, though. Um, all of the reports and, and the testing that we've done shows that the interface works just fine, even with that nuisance message. Okay. All right. Thank you, TJ. So next question is from uh, Panagiotis. Do we need dual USB sticks and a dual installation with demo files on them? You do not. Um, the, the easiest way to do that is uh, to go ahead and pull the breaker for IFD number two. So you can start up IFD number one with a demo file and then pull the stick as soon as it fires up, stick it in the number two unit and then push the breakers back in on the number two unit. They should sync up, um, but you can also do it with, with two USB sticks as well. Um, we have run into a few issues where if if too much time has passed between the time that you booted number one and the time that you booted number two, um, there could be some cross-sync ramifications there. So it, it's worth considering and thinking about, but if you do it quick enough, it should sync back up and, and off you go. All right, next question is from Andreas. Wants to know when installing a Garmin GI275, is the interface going to be the same as on the G5 installation? Short answer, Andreas, I have no idea. I have not put my hands on a GI-275 yet. Um, I, I know very, very little about the interface. What I can tell you is that if it's using Airing 429, we output pretty standard Airing 429 stuff. If it's using analog deviation info, we absolutely put out standard deviation info. Um, but as far as the interface itself, our engineering team, and none of us have put our hands on it, wired the thing up, or done any testing on it whatsoever. So. Um, I suspect if it's just using standard information to do what it's doing, um, it should work just fine, but I have absolutely no way to prove that to anyone. So um, we will put it on our to-do list and see what we can do. All right, so next question from Luke. He wants to know, on the alternate way to wire an Aspen ACU that you mentioned, different from the manual, how will the installation have issues if wired per the original diagram in the manual? I recently did an install with an Aspen EFD 1000 and an ACU with an IFD 540, wired it per the manual, and it, I didn't perceive any problems, but want to make sure I didn't miss something. Nope. No, Luke, there, there won't be any problems at all. Um, you can absolutely wire it the way that the book says to wire it. Um, the only kicker there is that if you do the, the bypass wiring like we talked about, um, it will actually give the IFD more of those 429 labels than it will if you go through the ACU the way that the book says to do it. Um, it's not going to hurt anything, not going to cause any problems or anything else. Um, one thing that that can be a ramification of that, just to be aware of, is <clears throat> if the IFD is doing an approach that has a GPS terminated leg in the approach, it requires barrel corrected input. Otherwise, it's going to give you manual sequence required, okay? So from a pilot's perspective, if he's expecting it to sequence through that approach procedure without him having to touch anything, 
and do it all automatically, he's going to need that barrel corrected input. The ACU will strip that label out. So he's not currently got barrel corrected altitude coming into the IFD. Now, if he doesn't care and doesn't mind hitting the button when it says manual sequence required, because that's really all it is, you reach up and hit a button on the IFD and it says, okay, good to go. <laughs> so if he doesn't mind doing that, um, then it's not a problem at all. But uh, we, we have had, you know, a handful of installations where, uh, you know, the pilot takes the aircraft, they go home, um, start reading the pilot guide, doing a little bit, little bit of digging on their own, and they go, hey, wait a minute, this, it doesn't automatically do this for me. It tells me that manual sequence is required. Well, that's why. It's because he's missing the barrel corrected altitude input. So, um, nope, doesn't cause any problems at all. Just makes some things a little bit more difficult than they need to be for the pilot. All right, so the next question is from Norm. He wants to know what errant data will the IFD pass to an APX transponder? So I asked for some clarification if he's referring to our AXP transponders. Maybe there's a typo there. So Norm, if you could clarify in the comment exactly what transponder you're referring to. Yeah, assuming we're talking about one of the AXP series, the Avidine transponders. Okay, thanks, Norm. Um, so it, there shouldn't be any Air Inc. 429 data coming out of the IFD going to either of our transponders. Um, our transponders are, are basically set up to look for RS-232 data. So on the AXP-322, it's going to be uh, AXP-322 in and out on the RS-232 channel. Um, and then on the AXP-340, um, the XP340 input is going to be set up for trig ADSB, and the Avidyne equivalent of trig ADSB is ADSB AVI on the output side um, of the IFD, and that should get you all set. All right. So if you guys have not answered the poll yet, please do so. Um, this information is highly valuable to us, um, and it lets us know how we can best help you guys, because that really is what this is all about anyway. All right, so next question is from Garrett. With an Aspen to IFD, can you use both 429 outputs from PFD and ACU to two 429 inputs on the IFD to get all the data and labels, or is that just redundant? Um, it's redundant, Garrett, and it would probably confuse things. Um, if, if you're going to go to the effort of, of trying to tap into the airing 429 data straight from the EFD 1000, uh, I would recommend just leaving that the way it is. Take it from the EFD 1000 and call it a day. Um, all right, guys. Um, again, want to say thank you to everybody for showing up to this thing. Um, we really appreciate it. And if we can provide any better data for you guys, uh, anything at all to make you guys' lives a little bit easier out there, um, by all means, let us know. If you guys you know, didn't answer the poll or maybe maybe there's other topics that, that I didn't put in there as potential answers for the poll um, that you guys would like to see some training on, don't hesitate to shoot an email over training at avidine.com. Um, beyond that, uh, I think we're just about finished up here. If there aren't any any further questions, um, oh, so we got, got some, we got some okay. questions rolling in. So Hugo wants to know: Is it possible on a single IFD installation to have two IFD 100s running on different iPads in the cockpit? on a single IFD installation with two IFD 100s. Yeah, you should be able to do that. So right now the the uh, the limit of iPads per IFD navigator, uh, as mentioned in the pilot guide, Hugo, um, it's two iPads per unit. So, you know, you can, you can run two IFD 100s connected to a single IFD, just like you can run four flight on one iPad and the IFD 100 on the other iPad, as long as they're connected to that's a single IFD. So next question is from Panagiotis. How do we wire dual IFDs for GPSS? 
Hmm. I'm going to need a little bit more info on that. Um, I'm, I'm not sure what we mean by the question there. How do we wire dual IFDs for GPS sets? Um, are we talking about a, a GPSS converter? Yes. Do we need a GAD42 in that case? Ah, uh, gotcha. Okay. Um, yeah, so if, if it's a GPSS converter, um, you know, it, it's, I don't think you'll need a GAD42 necessarily. That's probably overkill for that scenario, but you would need some way to switch, uh, you know, your NAV input going into the GPSS converter. So you'd want to, you'd want to have those 429 lines switchable uh, between NAV1 and NAV2 and make sure that there's some enunciation involved there too, so that the pilot doesn't get confused over which navigator is actually flying the autopilot at any given time. Um, now, that being said, if you have dual IFDs in the aircraft that are cross-synced, there's no advantage to doing any of that because if you go, if they're cross-synced and you go in and enter your flight plan that I want to fly direct to, you know, this waypoint, then that flight plan is going to get loaded into both IFDs and both IFDs are going to output the exact same airing 429 data. So, um, if the IFDs are crossing, there's no advantage to doing, you know, dual maps that way, especially with a GPSS converter, because all that's going to listen to is that roll steering output anyhow. So, um, you know, I, I think I would advise, you know, just going ahead and, and do a, a single, uh, airing 429 output. <clears throat> And most of those are, are going to require uh, one of the gamma variety 429 outputs. All right, so Tom Harper, our director of marketing, um, posted us a follow on comment to the iPad connections. And he mentions for dual IFD 100s, you will need to go into the iPad settings for each IFD 100 and set the iPad, iPad ID number to one and the other to iPad number two. That way, the IFDU knows that there are two iPads out there talking to a single IFD. For dual IFD installations, there's also a setting to sync one iPad to the number one IFD and the other iPad to a number two IFD if that's what the owner chooses. Thank you very much, Tom. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Really appreciate that. Um, I, iPads and stuff, that, that is certainly not my forte. I'd much rather run wires in an airplane. So. <laughs> Good information, Tom. Thanks. A big thanks to everyone that's participating in the poll. Um, we're getting some great feedback here, and this is going to help us get you the information that you guys need right away. So thank you very much for participating in that poll. All right. Well, without further ado i think we're gonna call it guys um if you think of any questions you know if you guys are like me anyway you'll think of a dozen questions a half an hour from now um if you do by all means shoot those over to either tech support at avidine.com or training at avidine.com we'll be glad to answer those questions offline um and uh aside from that you know stay safe out there uh thanks everybody for for tuning in and uh keep an eye out because we've got a bunch more coming all right thanks